dear venerables tamil friends we are going to have the day's talk now may everyone settle down and give the consent with three times sadhu 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 tas bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse namo tas bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse namo tas bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse suryas bhikkave udayato etam bhubbangamam etam bhubbanimittam yadidam arunukkam evameev posattannam bhujjangaanam etam bhubbanimittam evam bhubbapam yadidam kalyanamittatati dear venerables and the dhamma friends last time we introduced this particular sutta known as surya sutta you find in the sangita nikaya and uh, this is uh, going to give you certain relationships which worth knowing as far as we are leading our spiritual life so the buddha uh, give an example at the beginning and then related to the our spiritual life uh, with certain variables and uh, through that uh, we can entertain a series of dhamma talks as far as this particular discourse or the sutta is concerned this is the second talk and uh, we in the first talk got the chance to discuss about the mindfulness as a factor of enlightenment and uh, with that basic knowledge today we are going to go step into the second uh, factor of enlightenment that is uh, dhamma vichaya that is the inquiring mind on principles so before going into that i would like to give the background or the basic information uh, where by how the sutta is revealing and they are the buddha explain uh because this is the forerunner and the precursor of the rising of the sun that is the dawn is a natural process before the sun rises inevitably you can see the dawn signs of the dawn and it is slowly slowly evolved into the rising of the sun and that is how the day break happens exactly the same so too because for a because this is the forerunner and precursor of the rising of the factor of enlightenment that is the association with good friends or noble friends so this indicates uh, your rising of or introduction of this enlightenment factors is appear to be completely organic internal affair and uh, we relate that to the meditation and that meditation also you sit in a cross legged position close your eyes and try to contemplate so that one day eventually uh, your internal qualities which develop up to the factor of enlightenment that means geared certainly towards the emancipation or enlightenment up to that uh, many things it is a internal matter or it is a personal issue cross legged then cross ties and contemplation at the buddha being omniscient he says it is not simply uh, going to a meditation center sitting on a cushion and cross legged and cross ties and meditation but it has some ethical or social impact before your mind come up to that kind of uh, enlightened position or uh, signs of enlightenment you may see external signs such as association with good friends or true people or noble people so socially that means or ethically that means you are bound to meet 
two people, that's called Sapurisha in Pali, and the noble people, and that is the uh, early signs, or we can say precursor, that your mind is developing. So therefore, uh, the, your development has two dimensions, one thing internal, one thing is external. So that external factor uh, is fairly beyond one's control with the true people available in, on the earth, how can we recognize them and uh, what is the relationship with that good vibrations of the good people, true people for one's mindfulness or one's concentration or one's wisdom, it's a cosmic factor. It is a kind of a relationship. Only the people going up to a certain height only can see others, those who have not gone up to that level, hardly find that kind of a relationship. So therefore it is part and partial of the responsibility of the Buddha to teach the people aspiring, hoping to go up to that kind of a real change in one's life. So therefore one has to be very sensitive, very open, very careful about the true people in our vicinity. We never, that is happening, uh, it appears like a coincidence, but it has a very deep impact on your thinking pattern, your psychology and your spiritual development. So it is something external and internal that balance, it's a very harmonious thing, that balance, that equilibrium is a very natural thing. So uh, one has to be very sensitive to the association with the people and the, that is external aspect and what is, how one's mind is developing. So that is the main theme of this particular sutta. And whenever the mind exposed or mind is diversifying, improving uh, towards the factors of enlightenment, uh, there are seven factors of enlightenment. Satta Bojjhanga by name, uh, starting with uh, mindfulness. So, to sum up or give a briefing about last talk, uh, how the relationship with the association with the true people and the noble people with the mindfulness, uh, the relationship between two factors, one has to understand mindfulness represents eight places from a commoner's point of view up to the enlightened being. The mindfulness itself is evolving. So the very early part of mindfulness may be very scientific, very technical. So you have to learn it, introduce it, but slowly, slowly it becomes organic, it becomes aesthetic or it becomes art. So when that happens, uh, it has a bearing towards external factors like the association, good friends and the uh, true people. So let me explain the mindfulness at the beginning we call for foundation of mindfulness. The four foundation of mindfulness start with the mindfulness of your posture or your body or maybe uh, it is representing as uh, metabolic function like breathing, in breath and out breath, or rising and falling of the abdomen, or when you are walking, left leg, right leg, or when you are forward looking, looking sideways, bending your arm, stretching your arm, and different postures and different activities. Each and every time you can see the body showing different uh, postures, macro, cardinal, as well as micro postures, always with posture and posture junctions. So how much we are aware of these four cardinal postures, one to the other, how it is changing in between, how many tiny little posture shadows or nuances. So when and where someone is keen about that, it's a, it's a long journey 
inward journey that is called kaya kaya anupassi viharati yatha hatitan yatha panihitan uh, whatever may be the way the body rests whatever the way body works uh, you follow it up with the mindfulness so that in simple english we can say you make yourself the best friend learn at each and every little physical activity with full of under, or under the light of mindfulness so when it is happening one can understand each and every physical movement is recorded in the brain in terms of feelings so there is a each and every physical action has a, another resonance or articulation in terms of feeling in the mind or feeling in the brain we can say neurologically and that is also a representative of the bodily functions and therefore when and we are one is uh, try to keep the bodily postures everything under the light of mindfulness it's a, it's a physical part and one can see it has its own mental aspect that is called feeling so that means each and every tiny little movements in body level or limbs level or even at the cell level each and everything is been recorded in the brain through the electro magnetic signals or sometimes chemicals so therefore if you are sharp enough you can feel you can understand how one posture to the next posture by looking at the physical features as a well as close your eyes you can feel how the mind is getting the feedback from the each and every action and vedana anupassana mindfulness on feeling it's a huge subject it is not limited to your body when and where you become sensitive when and where you pay attention to each and every movement of your body bodily function in terms of feeling then you can feel the other person's mind and other person's physical activities and read his mind therefore it is something go beyond the your physical limits so it is called non material kind of mindfulness so for that you can become qualified by becoming mindful in your materialistic part corporeal part body part and then you got the feeling and then you can understand how mind is taking rational decisions and different emotions and different other precipitation of the mental part and it feel happening each and everything happen with its due course it is not completely uh, going beyond control it goes beyond control as far as you are not observing your very body it appear like beyond control as far as you are not feeling you are tiny little feelings once you master the physical movements uh, postures and posture junctions and the feelings then you can understand uh, mind is working together with these two raw material and uh, you feel when you develop it is not your mind it is a human mind everyone is working in the same principle but you feel it is you or me or mine or myself because of your lack of information towards the bodily postures and the feelings more and more you be aware of your bodily functions and your feelings you find mind is working with the universal laws of the the mind chitta chitta niyama and then you can understand what is the mind of the buddha that's the mind of the enlightened being or what's the mind of the murderer what's the mind of any kind of a bad person uh, how conditioning takes place so when it is happening you are opening so much of broadness and ultimately you can understand and uh, not only the physical movements but seeing different colors seeing different shapes hearing different sounds smelling tasting each and every one is coloring your mind so that is called dhamma anupassana and when it is happening we call 
we are fairly acquainted with uh, mindfulness with respect to four foundations. So that is the starting point. So that is the part uh, present day uh, people, those who are uh, exposed to the mindfulness, these four are the basic uh, foundation going to teach children, going to teach patients, going to teach people with mental illnesses and people who wanted to have specific skillfulness like creativity and productivity. So this is very important because it has a fair bearing upon the secular understanding. But not only that, if you are going with the religious background, that very mindfulness supported with this four foundation mindfulness, it will be uplifted to the mindfulness as an organ. How we can make use of the mindfulness, Sati uh, Indriya, so you will be uh, specializing more and more when and where your faith is eroded off or overwhelming, or when and where your energy is slimy and slack or over enthusiastic and energized, when and where your concentration is completely scattered or fully concentrated, when and your thinking and imagination become overwhelming, how mindfulness you can use in order to balance them and how to put them into the comfort zone. And that is how some people use the mindfulness as organ or indriya. And you can see your efficiency, whatever the task you are doing, could be increased so therefore you feel the investment upon the mindfulness is gainful all the aspects right? together with your spiritual development. And when it is come up to the Sati Bala, the power of mindfulness, uh, you understand not only if you are very sharp, if you are, have a quick wit, not only you can be, take care about mindfulness in your day-to-day -day activities and changing of your posture and looking at hearing and things and all the kind of thing, you can understand there's a huge gaps or black holes in the mindfulness. Mindfulness is sometimes positive presence, sometimes completely absence. And one day you will understand these kind of black holes in the continuity of the mindfulness. Earlier, you try to avoid it, thinking it is something wrong with your morality, or it is something wrong with your understanding of the mindfulness, or something wrong with your experience. So you try to understand lack of mindfulness, or wandering mind, or uh, absence, my absent-minded, or absence of the mindfulness as personal weakness, and at the Power of mindfulness level, you understand, is quite natural. At a time, it is mindful. You know you are mindful, but later you can sympathize yourself. I am not mindful, but I know I am not mindful. That is the point you go beyond the human capacity for that you have to have a very broad mind. Otherwise, you will never sympathize lack of mindfulness. When and where you try to understand the power of mindfulness or oh, see the lack of mindfulness under your very nose and still if you are not undisturbed, this is the point where mindfulness is going to be uh, your power. And once that come up to that level only, mindfulness has the factor of enlightenment uh, going to happen. So there one has to understand mindfulness itself is going through some evolution and each and every one uh, refining further and further. So it goes without saying the definition of mindfulness is not static, it's changing. But the beginners, when we are giving me you very square, square, very rational definition for the mindfulness, but don't make it hard and fast, keep it open. Let the each and every person to experiment with and experimenting and giving, going, to, going to give their own definition 
So my hobby is after introducing mindfulness, I ask them to interpret it or I ask them to write articles or ask them to uh, reflect it and I often collect all the information as to how different people define mindfulness according to the, their background as well as their evolution. So therefore it is a very interesting area. So once, when and where I come up to the uh, factor of enlightenment, uh, that is the point you start to see other people, those who are meditating, they we can easily recognize as true people. They are the noble people. So when you are armed with mindfulness, then you can read the other person whether he is maximizing mindfulness or he is aiming at mindfulness. If it is so, you see more than a blunt relationship, you feel the relationship with that kind of people, uh, very easy to deal with them. Without your own mindfulness, even if you are waiting till the uh, Buddha, the metta year to come, with full barrel full of mindfulness, you will never get plugged in. You don't know what is the mindfulness is. When the Buddha is going to teach you, you will say you are not the Buddha, you are a, a missionary person from the other, for other religion, get out. Because you don't know. You don't know what is the mindfulness, therefore you don't know who is the true, true person. You don't know the real noble person because you must have your own feeling, your own definition, your own evolution on the mindfulness, then only you can understand the other person. So, once it is, once it becomes a factor of enlightenment, the Burmese Sayados, they used to say, then you know the mindfulness as for foundation of mindfulness and the mindfulness has a factor of enlightenment. Now you know only the not only the mindfulness, how it is evolving. And when you have a preliminary kind of mindfulness like uh, contemplation of the body, then you know my mindfulness is at that level. You know now it is at the feeling level. Now it is at the mental level. Or it's like an organ. Or it's like a power. So you get fair qualitative definition of the mindfulness. That's the point we can say your mindfulness has come up to the level of factor of enlightenment. So therefore you never use the simple term mindfulness specifically and you try to understand where are the state of mindfulness, what is the next step you have to develop. And that is how you, whenever you are do physical work, verbal expressions of thinking all the time uh, make that event in order to maximize mindfulness and to read your whole activity through the yardstick of mindfulness uh, then you find less and less frictional of your life rather than when you are starting the mindfulness with your body. When you are starting the mindfulness introducing at the uh, physical activities painfully slow. It's painfully so, quite discouraging, so much of distractions and you hardly you get the proper balance. But when it, when it comes up to the factor of enlightenment, you find nothing can disturb mindfulness from morning to evening. You can have the continuity of mindfulness if you really know the power of mindfulness. Then onward, uh, if I had to put in a uh, way one of the Westerners put, you start as a big, uh, commoner, just a man from the street, introduce mindfulness, you find very difficult because it is not our day-to-day -day language. So when you are starting, it is very slow and you find even if you are going to sit one hour, maybe a split second or two you, are, two, you are mindful, most of the time you are not. So you are very discouraged and you inferiority your assessment and you will think, I know I am not a person to develop mindfulness life. But, but if you keep on striving, one day when you come up to the enlightenment level, you be a spiritual being and here and there you do human mistakes and you understand this is the way mind is you know, wandering off, daydreaming, fantasizing, but that lack of mindfulness is surrounded by beginning at the end, your mindfulness. 
in the middle you understand you are not mindful but you know in the tapestry in the whole canvas you are mindful here and there you have human error and that is very interesting for you to understand how much i sympathize my human errors and that is why the buddha even out the full enlightenment he told i am not a brahma i am not a gandharva i am not deva i am a human that very expression it's a it's a deep meaning even the buddha is having human characters human qualities i am i can't claim that he has human errors but he is a human but the beginner never sympathize once always wanted to have theoretical maximum of mindfulness so they are very cursing and disturbed and worried and tense when never mindfulness is lack but at the level of enlightenment you consider this as a hobby yes i am fairly mindful as i know i did that mistake before i know it while i am doing i do it know it at the end i know it it's a some it's a natural happening it's a phenomena so nothing to worry but you can understand unmindfulness so that is how a factor of enlightenment mindfulness as a factor of enlightenment uh, you understand as a spiritual being how human mistakes can happen and through human mistake only you can talk with the beginners your mistakes is the language tools for the beginners to communicate so we can put it this way when one once you come up to that level of uh, continuing to the mindfulness from morning to evening still you have to associate with the beginners or sometimes teach them or sometimes give introduction and most of the beginners claims i can't understand that kind of a grammar the profound teaching let me have explanation very simple easy then only you can relate with him means how much you did your mistakes while you are practicing share with him they feel quite happy communication is take place that communication is happening with your subconscious not with the rational conscious mind subconscious so therefore all your mistakes are going to be a teaching techniques or tools uh, to tell others the beginners so that is how the buddha used the jataka stories more than 500 or more 550 he collected all the mistakes he did it for eons of time and they are so important you see most of the buddhist never learn what the buddha taught after the enlightenment they are very happy to learn jataka stories it's, it's a very common joke in sri lanka <laughs> it is interesting to the humanness so in the during the vesak time you put the big pandals and the stories and everything on the jataka story oh the buddha before the enlightenment they can feel it it's a human but the buddha after the enlightenment told he told i am human i have compassion to you i am sharing my old mistakes so that is the way are the fact of enlightenment mindfulness as and then only only then it is become a Uh, aspect of eight noble eight noble path mindfulness at the the samasati or the true mindfulness a wider mindfulness and uh, mindfulness as a uh, factor of mindfulness at the path of the eight noble path limb of eight noble path so with that uh, or let me explain therefore if you understand all the 37 factors that the buddha presented mindfulness appear eight places or eight episodes from kaya anupassana or mindfulness of the body and going up to the uh, one limb in the eight noble path so therefore one has to understand don't try to get a hard and fast definition for mindfulness always try to uh, try, always let it evolve and each and every time you uh, develop mindfulness uh, mindfulness get different shapes and different definition different nuances so if you are open it um, 
you may accommodate what the Buddha mentioned, whether you like it or not, whether you know or not, each and every moment you are mindful, only thing is you don't know. That is what the Buddha says, Sabbe Dhamma Satadipatiya. Everywhere mindfulness is taking control, but if you do not know, you are the sovereign. But from morning to evening, you comes to know each and every time, even whatever the uh, devastation or any damage or any unbearable situation, still you can be mindful. Whatever the gain, whatever the uh, lucky thing happen, still you can be mindful. So that is how uh, the mindfulness gain is different uh, layers and with <clears throat> mindfulness as a factor of enlightenment, then we are going to uh, Dharma Vichaya, more kind of inquiring mind, inquiring mind into the Dharma, that is also one of the factor of enlightenment. So we have to understand how that is related with the association with the true people, association with the noble person, and uh, I would say external noble person is the Buddha, internal noble person is your mindfulness. Then naturally the inquiring mind is developed. Your Dhamma knowledge is ever-growing. So therefore as far as you are mindful, each and every moment you get what you call Dhamma sap, Dhamma juice, nutrients. When and where you are mindful, you are losing your Dhamma knowledge and you are damaging. So therefore, uh, whenever you go to the factor of enlightenment, enlightenment, the inquiry mind as the factor of enlightenment, you have to understand where the theoretical knowledge, simply traditional Buddhist days is the canon, Tipitaka. And on top of that, commentaries, sub-commentaries and a lot of things are there. And now, for to that amount of information. Now there are a lot of scientific research doing in neuroscience, psychiatry and uh, brain uh, and stress reduction. So much of information, uh, the Buddhism and the scientific research come uh, in terms of. So that is also a colossal amount of information available. All the information, if you are going to use without mindfulness, I would say the shortest cut to the asylum. You can go mad very easily, it is a shortcut. But if you are learning Tipitaka, gaining this whole scientific research and all the kind of thing, while mindfulness is evolving, you are at the top level of the world. You are, you are governing the world. You can see the world, what is happening. So therefore, if you wish to develop uh, Dhamma Vichaya or inquiring mind and the Dhamma knowledge, uh, be mindful. And uh, for my understanding, Venerable Jnana Rama was in Nishatramaniya and Upanita Sayado in Burma, I can't imagine their knowledge that whenever you, they, you make a decision, do something and uh, practicing enormous amount of knowledge and uh, of course they are elderly people, they have spent a lot of time in academic part, but the secret is not with their memory capacity or kind of thing, they are always mindful and therefore each and every event, even with the encounter with the newcomer, they are gaining so much of information, nothing they throw away. They, they, everything they get and fit into their knowledge, so therefore it is ever increasing. So if you wish to have so much of knowledge, I am not really appreciating it, but I'm, the, my way of thinking is, uh, we must have certain amount of theoretical understanding, we must have certain amount of deductive and inferential knowledge, and if you wish to increase it, don't go just by academic way or don't think you can gain it by your operation or pellet, tablet or injection or any charming or any, any kind of thing. But the secret is mindfulness. So I would say when and where 
theory understanding or canonical understanding or languages or grammar, whatever may be, uh, to ever increase, internally you must be mindful, externally you must associate that kind of true people or noble people and you will understand even though true and noble people living in your society, you can't recognize them unless otherwise you are mindful, unless otherwise you know how to understand the quality of the true person. So you have to develop your quality, then only you can understand the true person. Everyone appear to be, everyone wish to be, everyone sometimes come and help us uh, with this nobility and kind of thing. But ultimately we end up with disappointments because we don't know who is the true person. Everyone is uh, doing advertisement and campaign. Nowadays we are in the election, you can understand what is happening, uh, they, what they do in the election campaign. So that is a word. But still, true people are there, but to get connected with the true people, you must be mindful. After explaining, I will try to go a little detail uh, how this uh, inquiring mind or Dhamma Vichaya or Vichara as a mental factor or uh, openness develop. When and where you are meditating, and what, what I mean is when you become a moral person and you wish to develop not only the bodily and physical culture mind, but cultured person, but to mental culture, then you are using two mental factors. They are recognized as jhanic factors, vitakka vichara. Vitakka vichara, they are the Pali words, and been translated into English as applying thoughts and discursive thoughts. Whenever we are open, or we can say awake, not sleep, you have to understand uh, one individual means five physical faculties, uh, eye sensitivity, it is always related with the visual objects, ear sensitivity is related to or connected to sound waves and the nose, tongue, respectively created with the smell and the taste and the body with the tactile. So, just consider, in a given moment, eyes are open, visual objects are there. Eye, ear is intact and sounds are there. And the smell is there, sensitivity of the nose is there. Taste is there, the, the tasty foods are there. And you are sitting or whatever, maybe touch is there. So, in a given moment, six faculties and six external impingements, they are fighting each other, which one will get connected to each other? If you are to be a seer, you must suppress the ear, nose, tongue and the body. Otherwise you cannot be a seer. So moment you select seeing and give priority to the eye and the visual object, that very selection that very priority selection is suppressing the ear and the sounds, nose and the smell, tongue and the taste and the bodily and tactile sensation. So therefore you have to understand, uh, the, according to this example, in a given moment, there are a lot of options are available, but only one donkey at a time in mind principle. So out of the whole range, who is selecting the priority? Who is selecting the connectivity that my mental factor is called Vitak? So therefore, whenever, for example, when you go for a buffet diet, what you are going to select is not already decided. Everything is there. According to your likings and dislikings, you serve your plate. Likewise, in an open day, uh, you have visual objects and the eye, but at a given time, Unless otherwise you're mindful, you think while seeing you can hear, while seeing you can do all the kind of thing that is where the audio visible pictures are. Sounds are there, pictures are there, and the sitting cushions are there. They tried with the smell and the taste also, but it was a failure in the film industry. 
and you see all the things are being fed with the audio visual thing but if you are mindful you will see at a given moment you can either be seer or hearer when something happening other thing is suppressed if you are if you do not know the egotistic idea can happen if you know one thing at one thing one dog at a time through the mindfulness you find your ego build upon lot of assumptions and little bit of reality that reality is what we call contact that is what we call under the nose and that connection happen through this vitakka applying thoughts so applying thoughts is so sharp in a given moment without prior science it connected on pleasure principle to give more pleasure give more uh, desire more egotistic more conceit so therefore even if you wish to be a decent person even if you wish to have a uh, physical and verbal restraint your vitakka is working with completely different agenda if you do not know what happens is when the vitakka selected the wrong thing after finishing the task you are just regretting thinking that i am the person did the bad thing but it was done by the vitakka beyond your control it happened because you are not mind so they are when and may are you mindful the buddha says to start with one thing at a time close your eyes go to a silent place don't smell and the entertain taste just be aware of your body and understand how the stream of consciousness when you are mindful and once that is developed only you can understand when and where your mind is fully absorbed with your body or in breath and out breath you can't hear the sounds you can't hear your body you can't feel anything because you are so absorbed that is the continuity of the mindfulness and the focus but in the day to day activities when you are not meditating so swiftly the vitakka the applying to the jumping from one to the other the buddha give the example of a mad monkey jumping from one to the other without any prior notice and without agenda without your consent so ultimately you have to give explanation for that bad behavior of the vitakra uh, but if you know if you can catch the fellow red handed then you can understand vitakra never give any uh, value gravity for moral shame and the moral fear even though you are physically and verbally try to be a gentleman gentle person but the vitakka no any restraint so therefore you have to understand the vitakka it is the what get connected with the particular organ and the particular sensuous impingement on the or the external impingements so understanding that when you try to understand that you have to restrain others and look at one thing and contemplate upon one object only problem is it is boring it is monotonous it is sleepy it's uncertain it's fearful why i am cutting off all the things and looking at the one thing you can't understand so therefore 99% of the beginners give up meditation because it is boring is very very monotonous and you can sleep while walking not to mention sleeping in city so that is the trick so you have to repetitively apply into one object and keep it in view with knowing or be being prepared with this boredom monotony uncertainty that we call Uh, spiritual endeavors many do not know that is to understand the function of the vitakka vitakka means out of a many range uh, how do you get with one 
and by selecting one, you suppress others. So that function is done by the Vitaka. Vitaka once restrained will be your best friend. Vitaka unrestrained, you are brutal enemy. So the Buddha says, Diso disanyantan kaira vedi vapana verina miccha panihitan chittam papyonan tatokari. Just like an enemy to the enemy or robber to robber, how they are killing each other exactly when your unguided mind is doing what the enemy is doing to you or robber is going to do because your vitaka never born discipline is born vivid. So understanding that is disheartening. That is why we feel bored. And once the vitaka somewhat understood and restrained, you can understand when the mind is for a given moment, thought moment, connected to one particular object, that particular object you can touch, you can feel, you can taste, you can get the impression. If it is not connected, everything is an imagination. It's a hallucination. It is uh, you are drunken or you are in a dream. Only the thing direct, directly connected through the touch, uh, the fitaka only, we can say under the nose experience. All the others appear like under the nose, but they are not so. So therefore, when the vitaka goes there, for example, uh, a mix of sounds or bodily pains and thinking, imagine your mind goes directly to the in for example, and you know now I am with the face-to-face -face with the in -breath. At that time, how do you feel the in is It's called vichara, or direct touch of the in -breath. And that very understanding of the in while the Vitaka is intact and mindfulness, you and the Buddha is the same. Whenever the Vitaka is directed to one particular object, your touch of that in object, feeling, is exactly like the Buddha. So if you wish to feel Buddha, if you wish to appreciate Buddha, don't let the, don't listen to the unruly mind. Only listen to the what you directly touch through the vitaka. And that even it is very tiny little thing that unmistakably it, we can say things as they are. So therefore that very touch, selecting from the so-called truths or appear to be truth or hallucination is just like a selecting a true friend amidst of all the kind of people. So therefore, vitaka vichara, which, which vitaka is applying to, vichara is the touch of that, or feeling of that, or a sense of that. So selecting this is direct experience. Others are not. Buddha says, I can't take responsibility, you must know. If you can't filter them, you are totally mixed up with your liking and disliking, your hopes and the reality. And that is how the literature means. Literature means utter useless thing. Very little bit of reality and gloss over into such an extent, ultimately reality becomes insignificant. So that is why literature is misleading. But the Buddha says, if you can discriminate, this is Vitaka Vichara and this is something beyond that or assumed thing or daydreaming or fantasizing, select, once you select it, you become so genius, something like you get a uh, gem out of the sands in the mine. You take the whole the mud out and wash it and you select the gem out of the whole billions amount of grains of sand. Otherwise, you are utter lost in the business. So your selection uh, understanding, making use, delimiting, discrimination of the gem from the sand is exactly like understanding the true person, exactly like vichara. So you are responsible. So therefore, understanding what is reality and what is appear to be reality or deductive knowledge is the kind of uh, 
landmark, uh, you can understand the vichara or inquiring mind. So even then, then only you will understand your organs are cheating you. Your eye, even say it is I see and I touch it, I smell it, but uh, they are not, unless otherwise it is seconded by other things, your organs are cheating you. For example, when you in a dream, you see your relatives, but you can't touch it. Sometimes in the darkness you can touch it, but you are not sure till that you put on, put on light and see it. So you can understand each and every organ, organ information getting from the organs never complete by itself, otherwise it is seconded by others. So that is why the vichara is very important. So one has to reduce daydreaming, fantasizing kind of thing and try to increase the direct touch happening to this vitaka and understand this is, even if you are a criminal, even if you are a non-Buddhist, this capacity in the human brain is a great uh, new thing happening in the evolution. Only human being can discriminate this is direct touch and this is not. And that is the point Buddha is addressing and whatever the discriminatory knowledge the Buddha is having by himself, no use, no avail for you. The Buddha is giving the knowledge, don't believe everything in wholesale, try to discriminate what is the direct touch, what is your personal experience and what is not. Uh, I would say education is completely other way around. Education is going to give the past knowledge, others' knowledge, and going to give degrees and diplomas and only the, and going to give the caps and kind of thing. I think it's better to give two horns instead of a degree. It, it is so distracting you, it is so eccentric. And if you know it, I think you are better off. Otherwise, you are in a dream. So that is the difference of the teaching of the Buddha and the teaching of this education. And that is why we have to have education, but it must be more closer to the reality. And uh, on that sense, Buddha stand completely different from the other religious masters. Buddha says, that is, you are the your savior. No one can confirm you whether it's a reality or not. And uh, next to the education, the killer of that truth is the religion. Religion is always pulling you out of the reality and try to make a dream world, this and that. So many are happy to listen to the Jataka stories than the teaching of the Buddha. So you have to, you have to understand this is the way we were roaming in the samsara and occasionally only we hear the words of the Buddha. And he says, you have the potential, but by itself it is not coming up. So you have to highlight it, apply to one thing at a time, and then get the touch of it. And when you are observing it, it's very quickly you can understand things are in a changing mood. But when you are just think that you have seen, or you are imagining, then you think things are permanent and benevolent and auspicious, but when and where you see the thing under your very nose with the Vitakka Vichara or Vichara Buddhi or Mimansa, inquiring mind, you can understand how much your organs are cheating you and then and there, if you are sharp enough, some of them you can prove, some of them you can disprove and that you can't depend on others' knowledge. On the inferential level, you can do it. When that is happening, even though you are not enlightened, you can understand more and more you put forth effort, your direct touch or your personal experience slowly, slowly increasing related to the, or proportionate to the time you invest. But the early part of this proportion is very, very slow. But after a while, you can understand why all the appointments are going to lead into the disappointments because your uh, 
basic facts you select understood as the truth is just appear to be truth but it is not the truth so therefore more and more you are believing on your own inquiring mind your own direct yatha bhuta jnana things as they are uh, you are just another human being a mist of all the human beings you are not above level or you are not below you are just human and then you will see the other discrimination we do other sectarians and we do because we are not reality we are not realistic we do not know the dhamma vichaya and with that respect you can understand the if there are any other person on the earth they are believing their own direct experience and when it is not they know verily this is not justified this is not verified non verifiable thing he consider it as a separate category they are inferential knowledge they are reference they are rational knowledge or deductive knowledge and never get mixed up so that is what we do in a meditation in sitting and walking always try to get even if it is tiny little bits of data if it is direct touch you have to pick it and that is why i love mahasi system mahasi system means directly pointing into that when you know you are in in breath just try to see what you experience in your in breath and experience when you are in the out breath what is the difference between in breath and out breath difference when you are walking whenever you are on the right leg you know you are in the right leg by without looking at it you know it and when it is shifting to the left leg what is the difference between the impact or the touch of the right leg and the left leg the day you understand discreetly or discriminately or in a delimited way your sharpness of your mind is go so deep one day if you can understand that slowly slowly easily mind will understand what does it mean by dhamma vichaya what does it mean by vichara buddhi or vichara that is to say two particles maybe two atoms or subatomic particles but the difference between and just at the outlook just at the face value they are be completely different whenever you are going to see again and again so fast so quickly they ultimately appear more common character than discriminative character that is the glimpse of the understanding and continuity of the understanding so vichara if you have the sharp vichara you can see if you look at an object once then you get different view if you going to see it again and again consecutively it's your impression your direct relationship changing in such a fast way uh, simply you will understand the impermanent nature of the truth impermanent nature of the phenomena that is why the buddha mentioned if you are to look into a one particular thing with the sharp vitakka vicharo applying thoughts and the discursive thoughts then you will understand it is so fast one day it happened me to with a young boy to get a theodolite is a instrument for the surveyor and you can see far away things so i just want to see the moon and the person helped me to focus into the moon and before focusing moon set when you are focusing or star or moon into the theodolite screen it is so fast moving you can you have to always move the theodolite otherwise you feel like the moon in very stable dot in the sky but if you focus a very sharp uh, telescope or theodolite you can see how fast it is changing so when you have something you focus that is called concentrated concentration then you can see it is so quick changing is fearful it is threatening so we have no person have the personality to accept the fast changing thing that is why our mind never happy to observe same thing again and again it's always jumping from one to the other 
that's the cheating nature of the mind so what you have to do is you have to restrain yourself knowing it focus again and again to the same object and have an open mindedness to see even if the shape is changing manner is changing uh, any other natural character is changing that's a quality of meditation no improvement of the meditation but not lack of mindfulness is not a negative thing so these kind of quality that is called neurobics your different ner- nervous systems going to work not the traditional stereotype nervous system is to very circuits many nervous circuits going to work when you keep open the object when you observe the object with the open mindedness so that uh, inquiring mind is not only discriminate from one to the other it's a fast change of the same object is been welcome so then you are ever young if that kind of a mind is there you are ever young otherwise if you are going to think uh, things are permanent so just like the moon on the sky and it is there if you do not know it is fast moving uh, then you uh, your mind become very sluggish the stereotype values liking and disliking personality everything going to sets in because your mind is not open enough your mind is not radical enough reflecting enough but your capacity wise we all are the same we have the complete capacity that is why we have to respect each and every individual whether he is a criminal or whether it is buddha because any moment that uh, possibility he or she can understand moment one understand even though he or she is not enlightened he is almost like enlightened the understanding of the possibility understanding the the, the value of the human mind so many are brooding without knowing it they are waiting with the buddha to come they do this and that in order to get the enlightenment and doing all the kind of rituals and kind of thing i mean there yeah, may be some correction between the rituals and kind of thing but you can understand cut short the uh, way by introducing this inquiring mind introducing this radical mind so this dhamma uh, vichaya the buddha sometimes sum up till yon so manskara or wise reflection or path reflection or radical reflection so to before the end of the talk i would like to say some people born with this kind of a radical reflection some and the sun out so those who are with that kind of radical reflection they are very happy when they are learning the teaching of the buddha inviting this radical reflection but those who are not born with they are not happy with this kind of thing they are not reading this kind of a profound teaching of the buddha they listen just buddhism and uh, they can't understand they say it is very profound so what make you are born with that kind of a radical reflection and not born with radical reflection very difficult to think about so even the buddha never tried his teaching for each and every person he tried with the people prepared and coming towards him they are the target group so if you have any interest about buddhism or helping others or sharing with that be careful don't throw pebbles in front of pigs then you are the mistake so you have to really give it to the person who is prepared and they will absorb it and they are the people ready to understand true people and one day they also will be a true people so therefore don't do it wholesale business in buddhism is always retail limited always minority even the buddha never had so much of big uh, wholesale so therefore appreciate your own inquiring mind appreciating the appreciate the other people around surrounded with the inquiring mind and within them uh, you may find mindfulness is a very good language very good communication and when that communication happen 
there is no individual knowledge it, it is nonsense knowledge is human only the thing is where you get plugged in so to get into the plug into the hinduism it is called akash library or cosmic energy we are with the whole potential but if you are mindful and with the radical reflection and ready to accept things as they are uh, you may understand this is the only human existence we have that kind of a broadness that kind of a exposure to the mindfulness and the inquiring mind if it is so uh, things are fully ready if you are if you think uh, no it is depending on the other person or other places or other factors so much so you will never trust mindfulness you will never trust inquiring mind but if it is so very difficult for such a person to understand any change in the within in this very life so therefore hope this talk is going to give kind of a inspiration for those who are already invested on the mindfulness and the inquiring mind and uh, whenever you put the thing in the proper order you may see all the mishaps appear like a blessing in disguise and you will be a positive in thinking so wish for Uh, wishing everyone uh, having that kind of ref- radical reflection and dhamma vichaya sambhojange and will make it your spiritual journey easier uh, with that hope with that blessing i would like to sum up the today's talk thank you very much for listening